Well, it's a great honor and a privilege to be with you today and to share this auspicious moment in the graduates' lives and in the lives of the families of the graduates who have worked so hard, uh, no doubt, to put them through law school. I'm very grateful to uh, the faculty and the board of trustees uh, to Trinity for the invitation to address you at this moment. As the introduction to myself indicated, uh, I'm not a lawyer, uh, but I live in the same time as everybody else here. It doesn't matter what our callings are. Each of us has to pursue that calling in the context in which we find ourselves. Each of us has to pursue our calling facing the general challenges that face society at large. And I want to bring your attention this morning to one particular challenge and then reflect upon how it might impact you as you go into your careers as lawyers and also on one thing that you might want to think about, one thing you might want to bear in mind as you do so. I would suggest to you that the big challenge perhaps of our day, at least in the West, particularly in the United States of America, is this. What does it mean to be a human person? There are various questions that float around our society at this point. Is abortion legitimate? Under no circumstances, under some circumstances, or under all circumstances? Is euthanasia legitimate? Is IVF legitimate? And of course, the one that has perplexed so many over the last few years in the public sphere, what is a woman? I would suggest that each of these questions actually tracks back to a problem with the deeper question. And the deeper question is, what does it mean to be a human being? Of all creatures on the face of the planet, I think uh, it is more difficult to answer the question, what is a human being, than anything else. I might put it this way. Unlike all other creatures on the face of the planet, human beings are creatures of intention, not just instinct. I happen to live in western Pennsylvania. We have a, uh, a riches of wildlife in western Pennsylvania. We have birds of prey. Sometimes when I'm driving home from work, I'll see a bird of prey hovering over a field and then dropping and striking. I don't know what it has hit, but it has instinctively moved to kill whatever it has seen from its vantage point. We have beavers. Beavers build dams. I've never seen this, but I'm told that if a, an ant's nest catches fire, soldier ants will instinctively walk towards the fire as a way of trying to protect the nest in some way. Contrast that with human beings. We don't build dams, we build bridges. We don't build nests. We visualize, design, and then execute the building of homes. And we do not march by instinct into the flames to protect our houses and our loved ones. We choose to do so. We act freely. We are creatures of intention, not simply creatures of instinct. Our world, we might say, as a human world, is one of culture, not merely nature. If you travel across the face of the globe, if you travel from state to state in the United States, you'll notice significant differences between the way people live. Western Pennsylvania is very different to California. Uh, number of traffic lights uh, I went through this morning to get here in just 12 miles. Uh, I think you have more traffic lights here than I encounter in a typical decade in Western Pennsylvania. Uh, and cars move on weekdays in Western Pennsylvania. I noticed yesterday uh, the moving of cars. Uh, likely they move slower on average today than you would have done 150 years ago in a coach and horses. We create our own ways of relating to each other. The things that are most important to us are not just our natures, not just our instincts. They're the things that we choose to do, the way we choose to organize our lives and to relate to each other. And as I was reflecting, on what I should speak about this morning, it struck me that law 
is a great example of that. A very little knowledge of law, no formal training whatsoever. But it strikes me as I reflect upon law that no other species on the face of the planet has laws. Because no other species on the face of the planet lives freely as we do. They live according to instinct. There is no need for an authority beyond their instincts. We are free and therefore we need laws. Why do we need laws? I think we need laws, one, because they express a vision of the society we wish to be. And we have laws because being free, we're able to break them. There is no law that says a fox must kill a chicken when a chicken is placed in its presence. The fox will do that anyway, instinctively. We have laws because we are free. And I think two things flow from this. First of all, it's important to remember that laws represent a moral vision. I remember some years ago, I think it was 20 years ago, when there was a big debate in the public sphere on whether uh, torture should be legalized. It was around about the time, I think, of the Second Gulf War. And the arguments uh, were interesting. On the one side, I think you had Alan Dershowitz arguing that we should, as a nation, legalize torture. Because then, once it's legalized, we, should, we can regulate it. Everybody knows it happens. If it's legalized, we can regulate it. I was very impressed, though, and persuaded by an argument on the other side. And that argument ran this way, that even though we know our nations will occasionally break the laws they have, I would still rather live in a nation that aspired to a certain law code. Laws represent a moral vision for what society is. And that means, of course, that no law should ever be interpreted or applied in a merely procedural manner. Laws are there, not simply in and of themselves, but to realize and preserve a vision. A vision of what? I would suggest to you a vision of what it means to be a human being. And secondly, I think as laws represent a human vision, so they must be interpreted and applied in a manner consistent with that. And here I want to add another layer. Having said that human beings are free, that we choose to do things, we choose how we relate, we choose where we live, we choose who our friends are, we choose our spouses. Because human beings are free, human nature is not an abstraction. Human nature is a word we use to apply to lots and lots of human beings who freely relate to each other. Humans are not abstractions. We are persons. And as persons, we are to be treated as persons. Okay, and one of the things I think that is going wrong in our society at this point in time is we are increasingly treating people as abstractions, increasingly treating people as categories, increasingly teaching, treating people as the set of beliefs they hold rather than as persons, free personal agents. The idea that we are persons, I think, lies at the heart of the notion that all are to be treated equally before the law. All, for example, are to be entitled to defense at law. All have equal dignity. So the question then for those of you graduating today, going on into career at law, is this. How do you stay human? How do you stay human in a world which is increasingly trying to press us into its abstract mold? A world that increasingly refuses to acknowledge human beings as individuals of value and worth and as categories that may or may not carry value and worth. I want to suggest what you need to do is you need to cultivate 
those things that make us distinctively human. I mentioned earlier, I think laws make us distinctively human. No other species have laws. I would also suggest that there are other things that make us distinctively human, that we must work at cultivating in a world that increasingly, I think, presses against these things or denies them or sees them as weakness. What are they? Love would be one. I think love is something that only human beings understand and experience. Gratitude. We live in an age of ingratitude. Cultivate gratitude. I have an ongoing uh, debate with a colleague at Grove. Uh, he's heard me speak on gratitude before, uh, and I say that only human beings can be grateful. Uh, he's convinced that when he gets home at 5 o'clock at night and his dog comes to see him, his dog is grateful that he's come home. Uh, I suggest to you that his dog, it's merely a Pavlovian response because he knows he's about to get fed. Uh, and I am right and my colleague is wrong. That's the uh, forgiveness. Notice. Notice how these things are all distinctly human, but are all at a real premium in modern culture. Forgiveness, gratitude, and a love that involves self-sacrifice rather than mere sexual satisfaction. These are things that are rare in our world. Talking about love, I say to the students at Grove City College, many of whom get married shortly after graduation, whereas a man's love for his wife demonstrated more powerfully on the wedding day or when she has Alzheimer's disease and he's caring for her every basic need. Love is more powerfully demonstrated when one sacrifices oneself for another. And I want to suggest there's one other area to think about as you leave. Friendship. At the heart of friendship, I think, is the notion that we treat others as persons, not as things. We treat others as ends, not as means. What do I mean by that? The most beautiful friendships are the friendships where we are not engaged in those friendships for what we can get out of the person, but for the sheer delight of being connected to that person. And like gratitude, love, forgiveness, friendship too is at a premium in our society. We live in a world where all passion and desire is collapsed into the sexual. We live in a world where the purpose of life is seen as individual self-focused happiness. We also live in a world, and think about this, where many of the ways we interact with other people are now disembodied. I give a lecture at Grove on music. How music has moved from being a corporate thing. 200 years ago, you'd got to go somewhere where music was being performed. Music was a matter of communal production to a world where music is now disembodied and individualized. Think of Ubers. It was a time when you had to get into a taxi, speak to the taxi driver, exchange money at the end. There had to be bodily interaction. Now you can just call your Uber, set up the exchange, everything, without ever having to acknowledge the Uber driver as a person or a human being. Think about the way we use the term friend primarily now to talk about disembodied relations, Facebook friends that maybe we've never met. Friendship, too, is being disemboweled in our culture. And yet I would suggest to you that friendship is vital. Friendship is one of those things that humanizes us. It actually provides us with the context for love, for gratitude, and for forgiveness. And what is it that humanizes you? Is it not when you look into the face of another and you see that they look at you not as a thing, but as a person? Not as an object, but as a self. That's why the face is 
so critically important? I say to the students, interesting, faces are interesting, aren't they? Uh, I might say that uh, you know, I'm, I'm, if, if I were to go to, to work and say to the students, you know, before I left for work this morning, I kissed my wife's face. That sounds weird. It sounds weird, doesn't it? We don't kiss faces. We kiss people. I don't kiss my wife's face. I kiss my wife. Have you ever thought about kissing? It's kind of weird and unhygienic, isn't it? You know, gluing two faces together. You know, Freud points out that you know, nobody wants to share a toothbrush with anybody else. But we kind of find kissing sort of pleasant. And yet the hygienic difference is minimal. Why is kissing so pleasurable? I would say one of the reasons is this. It brings yourself as close to another self as it is possible to be. It is a deeply humanizing thing. It's one of the evils of pornography. Many evils of pornography, but one of them is this. It trains us to think of other people as things, not persons. And what is the greatest thing you can do for another human being on that front? It's to return that look, isn't it? As they look at you as a self, you return the look. And you see them not as a thing, but as a person. I'm fascinated by that phrase, uh, uh, a face that only a mother could love. Uh, you know that phrase? It's not a very flattering phrase. Uh, yeah, and it, 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 it touches on a deep truth, of course, doesn't it? It means, you know, whatever you get up to, however ugly you are, either as a person or physically, your mother's going to love you. The, the sad side of that, of course, is that your mother's kind of obliged to love you. And when somebody's obliged to love you, that's not as good as the freely given love of somebody who is not obliged to love you, looking at you as a person and not a thing. Face-to-face -face friendship is critical. I'm struck by the passage in Exodus 33, talking about Moses meeting with God in the tent of meeting. And we're told this, when Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. And when all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship, each at his tent door. And then there's this lovely line. Thus the Lord would speak to Moses face to face, as a man speaks to his friend. My charge to the graduates today is this. Continue the real friendships you have. If you want to apply the law in a human way, then you must be a human. And for you to be a human, you must acknowledge others as human. And how do you do that? Through friendship. Friendship is not an argument. Friendship is not a set of propositions. Friendship is deep, beautiful, and mysterious. Make new friends wherever you find yourself. Make real physical friends. I'm sure you can sort of be friends with somebody online, but for that friendship to be truly rich, at some point, you have to be in that person's presence. You have to look at them as a self and they have to look at you as a self. If you have friends, then two things will be realities to you. You will understand that human beings are free. Because it's not a question of, well, it's only a face that a mother could love. You freely love that other face, and they freely love you. And secondly, you will understand that human beings are persons. Human beings are not things. They are subjects. They are persons. If you want to answer the question, what does it mean to be human? You can read books on that. You can listen to people like me warbling on and on about it indefinitely. But if you want to really want to know what it means to be human, make friends. Look into the faces of your friends. It will make you better lawyers. But more than that, I think it will make you better people. Thank you very much for listening so patiently. <laughs>